ready? Yeah. Are you hungry? Yeah. Well, I want to just thank everyone for allowing me to be here today. I want to especially thank Chosen. What a great job you did. I want to thank Sister Demetria George. I like your haircut. <laughs> I want to thank Sister Barbara Bell. That was like the spiritual SOL. Yes, yes, yes. And all I could think of was, I'm hungry for some oranges right now. <laughs> some orange juice, some oranges. A reporter from up north yeah, decided he would do a comprehensive story about faith in America. He knew that this country was founded on biblical principles. He wanted to know in the 21st century were those principles still the founding decisions of the nation. So he started in California, went to a church out there, and when he got to that church, he saw something he never saw before. There was on the on the wall, there was a, a gold phone, and above that phone, there was a sign. And the sign said, direct line to God, $10,000 a minute. <laughs> he said to the pastor, tell me about that phone. He said, well, we direct line to God, but $10,000 a minute. Golden phone, that's how it is. So he traveled through the West, he traveled through the Midwest, he traveled through the Northeast, every church he went to, he noticed there was a golden phone on the wall, said direct line to God, $10,000 a minute. Finally, 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 he came to a church in Virginia. He came to that church in Virginia, he came in, he looked around, he was with the pastor, he said, Pastor, you got, you got a phone? He said, yes, we do. He looked, there it was up on the wall, a golden phone. It said, 25 cents a minute. Yes, and he said, Pastor, I've been all over this country. Every one of these gold phones says $10,000 a minute to talk to God. Can you explain to me why here, this is a 25 cent call? The pastor said, son, you got to realize now you're in the South. It's a local call. <laughs> well, I know in a way there's a lot of pressure on me right now because of my son. Pressure here, but I also know God gave me a message, so no, no pressure on me. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you what God told me to tell you. So if you're ready, here we go. I read this quote just a few months ago, and it just knocked me back on my heels. It's by a woman named Beth Moore. We've lost our theological minds to think it's enough for people of light to sit in the light, carry the light, show the light, preach the light, podcast the light, but not fight the darkness. Right. It's like showing up in the ring, decked out, belted, and gloved, and never throwing a punch. Are you going to throw a punch, people? It's yeah. time to throw a punch today. Okay. I'm going to give you today some moves because I want you to know the answer to the question, what's your move? Say that with me. What's your move? What's your move? I want you to know what your next move is because your next move changes everything. I'm going to give you four moves. We're going to start with Habakkuk's prayer in Habakkuk chapter 3. This is the first move. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigunah. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. Then he writes this. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, 
and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. He says, Lord, I look around, everything's going down to twos. I look around and there ain't nothing there for me to hold on to in this world. I'm looking around and I'm wondering, what do I do now? And then he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The first move is always the move of worship. Amen. Worship always puts God in the right place. Yes. What's the first move? Worship. worship. The move of worship. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you about my life just for a few minutes. I grew up in the church, but I never understood really what was happening. I knew something about Jesus was going on, but I didn't know really what was going on. I remember when we had the spiritual SOLs in my church, and they had a bishop come in, and, and the bishop was coming down the main aisle, and he was going to ask people questions, and I was 14, 15 years old, and the bishop was coming down the aisle, and I like got way down low in the pew. <laughs> I don't want the bishop to see me. I don't want him asking me a question that I didn't know the answer to. And after that, I, I was going through a vocabulary test at school, and I read a word. The word said agnostic. It's from the Greek gnosis, knowledge. And the A means take away knowledge. It means you don't know. You don't know. And I said, that's me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about anything, so I must be agnostic. I went to church for a little bit, then I stopped going to church. I went to college, and the whole world was falling apart. You remember the 1960s? And the whole world was just falling apart around me, and I didn't know. Amen. I just didn't know. A friend of mine, I went to him, and I said, Bob, there's got to be something more. Bob, there's got to be something more. And I was 20 years old, and I said, there's got to be something more. He said, I want to tell you something. I've been praying for you for two years. I want to tell you something. He opened up a Bible. Nobody ever had opened up a Bible in front of me before in my life. I was 20 years old. He told me something about Jesus. I don't even remember what he told me. I went home, and I cried in my bed that night. And I said, oh, God, if you're there, can you help me? I went to work two days later. A truck was backing up to a warehouse. I still to this day don't know how it happened. I looked down, the, sw the cab swiveled out of view. I couldn't see the driver, he couldn't see me. I was about to, about to yell, whoa, because the truck was gonna hit the building. And before I could say the W of a whoa, the truck hit my head, pushed it into a brick wall, and kept coming back. My mother always said, Michael, you have a hard head. <laughs> I proved it that day. And God got me caught, to get my attention, God got me caught between a tractor trailer and a brick wall. And everything in my life was in that next inch. Everything in my life was in that next inch. And the truck hit the building and set the brakes and stopped. And I was stuck, I couldn't move. I was, I was, I was crunched. And they came, they pulled the truck up, they took me to the hospital the ambulance. That night I was sitting at home with a massive concussion, but I knew somehow that I could have died that day. And if I died, I didn't know where I was going to go in my life. I needed to find out something about worship. I needed to find something about putting God in the right place Amen. in my life. Amen. So I went to see my friend Bob, who was going to a Christian college, Christian University in Indiana called Taylor University. And I got out there. And I hitchhiked all the way out there. And God got me there the day that they started Spiritual Emphasis Week. And every night, the whole student body went to the gym. And there was a preacher. He preached a message. And this is all I remember from the whole week. Jesus is alive. Jesus can change your life if you let him. Right. Jesus is alive. Jesus can change your life if you let him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. And every day, they kept feeding me. So I stayed. Because I'm Italian. <laughs> that's what we do. Are you hungry? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to stick around for a while. So they were feeding me in the cafeteria. I was listening to the message. Jesus is alive. He can change your life if you let him. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. I went to the Bible study. First Bible study I ever went to. The football team and the football players prayed for me, and I got goosebumps. But I still didn't know what to do, so I walked across the campus all by myself. It was about 9 p.m. at night, all by myself. And I thought, this is what they're saying. This is what I'm doing. My life doesn't make any sense. I don't understand what they're talking about. I never even heard this before. But what do I have to lose? So 
so I took the next step and I said, okay, I talked to the sky, I talked to the night, to the stars, to the moon. I said, okay, Jesus Christ, if you can change my life like these people say you can, go ahead and do it. And that moment, my life got hit by something big, boom. And I knew I put him in the right place in my life. I knew that he was in my life. It was as if all the agnostic in my head just blew away. <laughs> and I knew who I was for the first time because I was a child of God. Right. The first move is the move of worship. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Yes. The second move, the second move is the move of courage. Say courage. courage. The second move is the move of courage. Esther chapter 4. If you persist in staying silent at this time, at a time like this, help and deliverance will arrive for the Jews from someplace else. But you and your family will be wiped out. Who knows? Maybe you were made queen for such time. A time as this. You remember the story of Esther? There was a beauty pageant. Vashti got booted. And they had a beauty pageant. Because the king was, was puffed up and prideful. And had this whole beauty pageant. That went on a long, long time. Esther was chosen as the new queen. And she was Jewish. But they didn't know that she was Jewish. And so now she's in the palace. Now she's right there in a position of power. But she's never had power before. Who knows? Maybe you were made queen for such a time as this. Esther sent back her answer to Mordecai. Go and get all the Jews living in Susa together. Fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, either day or night. I and my maids will fast with you. If you will do this, I will go to the king, even though it's forbidden. If I die, I die. Mordecai left and carried out Esther's instructions. Esther had courage. Amen. She had courage to stand in the gap. She had courage to stand up. She had courage to do something that was going to make a difference in her life and in the life of all the Jewish people. And if she didn't do that, they were all going to get wiped out. You remember a guy named Haman? He built a big gallows, 75 feet high. He yes, built the gallows because he was going to take everybody out and hang them. And guess who ended up on the gallows? Haman ended up on his own gallows. Yes, sir. You take that, Haman, God said. You take that. You take that because you don't know and understand that I call my people to have courage. And when they step into courage, they step into the future. Because the second move is courage. Where do you have to step into courage today? Yes, sir. Where do you have to step into a gap today to do something for somebody? To do something that makes you stand up and tell the truth. Stand up for what is right. Stand yes, up for what yes, is good. Yes, stand up for what God wants you to stand up for. Yes. The second move in your life is courage. The first move in your life is courage. The second move in your life is courage. Let me tell you about the third move of your life. It's a big move. It's the move that I simply call do something. <laughs> Say do something. Do something. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? What is it you want? And listen what Nehemiah does right then. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. And did he pray out loud? No. Where did he pray? In his mind. Where did he pray? In his heart. He prayed. I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He was going to do something. Yes, sir. He was going to do something because God put it in his heart to do something. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. So it's nighttime. 
He's on his horse and he's riding around. He's looking at everything that's broken down. All the gates that are burned, the fire. Then I said to them, he gets back to the people and they all come out together. He says, and I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. Yes. So they began this good work. Yes. But when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? There will always be naysayers. There will always be criticizers. There will always be negativizers. There will always be people who want to bring you down. Don't pay any attention to them. Listen to what Nehemiah says. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Yes, sir. Say that with me. The God of heaven will give us success because it's the proof of doing something that changes everything. Your next move changes everything. So what's your move? When Cory Booker was the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, and there was violence everywhere, and there were drugs everywhere, and there was stuff going on everywhere, he was trying to figure out what was going on. And so he lived in a high-rise apartment building in Newark as, as the mayor. And there was, this, there was an elderly woman who lived in that high-rise apartment building, and he would bump into her all the time. And he got there, and he saw her, and she saw him, and she said, Mayor Booker? He said, yes, ma'am. She said, I know what you got to do. He said, well, ma'am, if you know, please tell me, because I don't know. And she says, I know what you got to do. He said, ma'am, please tell me, because I don't know. She said, Mayor Booker, I know what you got to do. He said, tell me what I got to do. And she said, Mayor Booker, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do something. <laughs> looked at her and he said, something, something, and then it hit him. What he had to do, he had to go on a fast in the middle of, of the city, right in the middle of a park where there were drug deals, right in the middle of a place where there were shootings. He went, and he went on a fast, and when he went on a fast, people joined him. When he went on a fast, people showed up. Other people came and said, we'll stand with you. And when they stood together, when they did something yes, together, something happened. Yes, when you do something, some is going to happen. Yes, sir. Well, yes. We have lost our theological minds to think it's enough for people of light to sit in the light, carry the light, show the light, yes, preach the light, yes, talk as the light, and not fight the darkness. Okay. It's like showing up in the ring, decked out, belted in gloves, and never throwing a punch. What's your next move, yes, sir? What's okay. your next move? There's a fourth move. It's a fourth move. This is the move of faith. Tell me faith. Faith. It's a move of faith. Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Faith is the ability to see what isn't there because God said it's there. Mm. Right. The ability to see what's there. Not because you see it, because you don't see it. But God sees it. He tells you he's going to do it. Yes, sir. And the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up in the sky. Look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can't count them. Please. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Please. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It takes faith. In what you can't see. Because God said it's there. So it's time for you to trust what he sees. Yeah. Not what you don't see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. About 10 years ago, I was in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I was at a leadership conference. I met a pastor from West Africa. From the, the, the country Togo. A little tiny country. So you could drive across the country in two hours. 
little tiny country, distance from Virginia Beach to Richmond. He drove across the whole country. And his name is Pastor Michelle. And I met him at this conference. He says, will you have lunch with me? Well, he asked the right question, because I'm Italian-American, right? <laughs> like God gave him the right question at. So we go to, we go out, we have lunch together, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what's a good question for me to ask him? And I think, oh, what's a good question? And I think, this is a very, I don't think this these words, but in the end, it's, it's my analysis. This is a very American question, a very Western question, it's a very leadership-oriented question. And I looked at Pastor Michelle and I said, What's your dream? I thought, man, step back. That is a good question I just put on the table. <laughs> step back from that question. What's your dream? And he said, look at me right now. He said, my dream is to save my village. Will you help me? And all of a sudden, I realized he wants me in his dream. And I don't even understand what it means to save a village. And I didn't go to lunch that day asking to be in somebody else's dream, but God said, Michael Simone, you're going to be in somebody's dream today, and we're going to do something together, because what you don't see, I already see. What you don't know, I already know. What you don't know how to do, I am going to do in you and through me. And so he said, will you help me? The dream is to save my bills. And I just said, I will try. I don't know what to do. So I went, came back here, made a call to a friend of mine in Chicago. I said, what do you know about drilling wells in West Africa? He said, well, I know a guy in Oklahoma. I called the guy in Oklahoma. What do you know about drilling wells in, in, in West Africa? He goes, well, I'm starting a program. We're going to do that. Why don't you come down here to Oklahoma? I got a training program. The training program costs $25. And I, this is exactly what he said. Training program is $25. It includes lunch. <laughs> <laughs> now I got to go to Oklahoma. I go to Oklahoma. I learn all about drilling wells. I take a group of people with me to West Africa. Before we go, they tell us there's no hope. You're not going to get water. You're not going to get a well because there is a layer of granite that runs under all these villages. These, are, these villages are primitive. It's like going back in time, 200 years, 300 years, mud huts, just growing corn, subsistence living. You're not gonna get water, so why are you even going? And I said, all I know is God told me to go. Amen. And so I went. And I had to preach in a village before we did anything. And 500 people showed up in this village. Out of the middle of nowhere, we are. You know where the boonies are? This is past the boonies. <laughs> you get to the boonies, you keep on going. And, and so we're out there, 500 people show up. I'm preaching. I'm trying to believe. And, 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 and I'm believing because God saw it and I didn't see it. And I, I told them exactly what I just told you a few minutes ago. The God of heaven will give us success. Yes. And everybody was saying, there's no water, there's no water. We drilled for about five days. We got down. I was there when they hit the granite. I was there. I heard the granite. Boom, boom, boom. I heard it. Clink, clink, clink. And then they installed the pump. And I got a, I got a van running, and I'm saying, you got to get in the van because we got to get to the airport. We got to get home. It's time to go. We got to get to the airport. It's time to go. And they installed the pump. All these people gathered around, and we stood there, and then somebody started pumping. And when they started pumping, everybody held their breath. And all of a sudden, you got water in there. You got water that's coming out. There were good people, there were people, there people, there clapping, people were laughing, people were crying, because God had to send somebody who didn't know diddly to get water. <laughs> Because he knew it was there. He yes, knew sir. the only person that's going to go is the person that doesn't know Diddley. Yes, he's not a geologist. He ain't going. you yes, got to get, get somebody who's not a geologist, who's not a scientist. Somebody who just believes that we're going to have faith to see what is isn't there. Because God told you it's there. A view of faith changes everything. And I want to show you a video now of where this has come in 10 years. This is an organization now. 
that's developing out of this. We need some bathrooms, we need some drinking fountains, we need some water. 
to do and stand for it. Why do we stand for it for our friends? Why do we let our friends not have water? So the whole point, the whole point of this, of this initiative is it's a biblically based, Jesus driven, God, God's holy hands blessed work to bring them water, to bring them education, to do orphan care, to bring leadership and health care to people who have nothing. And I've been there six times. And I'm telling you, it's so touching. They love us when we come, and they're thankful when we come, and, and they celebrate when we come, because they love God with their hearts, and they worship God with their hearts as much as we did here this morning. Amen. So can we do anything less than to go? Jesus said this in Matthew 17, 20. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, and biblical scholar N.T. Wright said it this way. He commands his hearers, Jesus, he commands his hearers to give up on their dreams and to trust his instead. Yeah. This, at its simplest, is what Jesus was all about. Yeah. This is what Jesus was all about. So what's your move? It's to be what Jesus is all about. To give up our dreams and to give life away to people who are never going to have it unless we go and, and bring it to them. And this is the coast of West Africa. This is where the slaves first came from. We are going back and we are bringing blessing upon blessing upon blessing because God loves us all. Yeah. And God wants to do something amazing in our life because he is good. Yes, he is. Yes, yes he is. Yes, he is. he is good all the time. Yes. It was, it was when my son Travis was a, a senior at, at high school down in Virginia Beach, and we came up here to watch a baseball game played at Walsingham Academy. So I got, got my grand, his grandfather, my, my father-in-law to go with me. His name was this is, this is not a lie. My grandfather, my, his, his grandfather, his name is Roy Rogers, okay? So, true story, true story. You ask anybody at IBM if they ever knew Roy Rogers, that's, that's my father-in-law. So Roy Rogers and I come up here, we go out to Walsingham, we sit on a bench out in, in right field, we're watching this game. Beautiful day, just like today, sun is shining down. Baseball game is one of those crazy baseball games where the score is like three to two and five to four and, and seven to six and eight to nine and, 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 and the, the players were not catching the ball, they were not hitting the ball. It was like they didn't even know they were playing a game called baseball. So like, what are we doing here? So it's the, the last inning and we're down by a run and you're just sort of hoping that, that something happens. I was at the Nationals game. They played the Mets in D.C. the other day. Travis and I were there together, ninth inning, and they were they were going to be down a run. And this guy stands up and he goes, "You gotta believe!" And it's like, it's one of those, "You gotta believe!" moments. So I'm sitting there and we're eating the peanuts, and it's it's right field, and we're on the wooden bench. And so the first batter gets up and he goes down swing. The second batter gets up. He gets a weak ground ball of short stop. He's out. So there's two out. Travis comes up the bat. Travis stands there confidently. He releases a single, a single to center field. Goes right up the middle. He gets on first base. Now one thing about Travis that he did not get from me, he is fast. <laughs> fast. I am slow. <laughs> My wife and I go to the grocery store. She's back in the car. I'm still in aisle two. <laughs> so Travis got the speed from somewhere. So the first pitch comes in, and it's strike one. Travis steals second base. The second pitch comes in. It's strike two, and Travis steals third base. Now, the kid at bat hasn't had a hit all season. So he has, <laughs> his, his bat arrow is like zero. It's zero. And he hasn't even looked like he wants to be there. <laughs> So he's kind of up there looking like this, and I'm thinking, you gotta like at least put the bat out there, maybe a miracle will happen. So so he he stands there, traps on third base, I'm watching this whole thing happen. The pitcher winds up, blows it right by this kid. Strike three, he's out, the game is over. So I walk across the field, Travis walks across the field, meets me at the pitcher's mound, and he, he asks this question that I'll never forget. He goes, what was the score, Dad? 
<laughs> I said, you lost by one run. You should have stole home. And he says to me this statement that goes down, should be in the Hall of Fame. He says this, if I only knew, I would have. He's in the game. <laughs> he's got on a uniform. He's got spikes. He's fast. You know, and, and I don't know what would have happened if he would have stolen home that day or tried to. But I do know this. As the pitcher wound up, if he broke for home, there would have been this blur of red and white and, and silver streaking down the third base line. Women with, with babies in the stands would have held their babies a little tighter. Old men, old men, old men would have put their hands over their hearts and stood up. <laughs> Look, little children who were playing in the dirt would have stopped playing for a moment and said, what in the world is going on there? And there would have been a slide, and there would have been a ball hit the catcher's mitt, there would have been a cloud of dust, and I don't know if the umpire would have said, save, or if the umpire would have said, out, but I know this, it would have been one heck of a finish to a baseball game. You see, here's the thing, we're all on third base. We're there all the time. And our next move changes everything. I'm taking your pastor, whether you like it or not. He can go because that's his move. Let that be your move with him. God yes. bless you.